Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald, is free on Amazon.com. Seeing the future comes at a price. What price would you be willing to pay to save thousands of lives? Mark Taylor knows his actions scream guilty, but he was only trying to stop the horrible terrorist attack. Instead of a thank you, the government labels him an enemy combatant and throws him in the brig with no rights, no trial, and no way to prove his innocence. He learns firsthand that the CIA can do anything they want to him, anything at all. Mark's just a regular guy, a photographer, who finds himself in an extraordinary situation when an antique camera he buys at a dusty Afghanistan bazaar produces photographs of future tragedies, tragedies he's driven to prevent. His frantic warnings about September 11th are ignored, but put him in the government crosshairs when he learns what being labeled an enemy combatant really means. Download this intense and gripping thriller now, free on Amazon. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald. As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, book one by Risa Walker and Caleb Ansel. From Risa Walker, the award-winning author of the best-selling Kronos Files, and debut author Caleb Amsel comes a chilling story of altered reality and psychological terror. Chase Ray sits perfectly still, his thumbs traveling across the screen of the broken computer tablet, stuck in the nexus between two worlds. Haddon Wood isn't real. It can't be. Another world, another reality, hovers just beyond his reach. He can see it sometimes. He can almost touch it. In that world, things are in balance. The dead stay dead and the creature feature remains safely on the screen. That world isn't a patchwork quilt of every scary book or movie he's seen. In that world, the nightmares generally end when you open your eyes and people don't glitch in and out of existence. Chase is determined to return to that world, although he's a bit worried that the only way out is through the noose that seems to lurk around every corner. He needs allies to get back home. But how do you choose your team when you can't tell who's real? As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Amsel. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business, and she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love and will help you to up your writing game. Pico's School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted, and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters. More in-depth courses will be added in 2020. Make sure you don't miss a thing. picoshouse.com slash newsletters. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2 are only 99 cents for a limited time. The gods are rightfully imprisoned, and Cess intends to keep them that way. But her terrorist father has other plans. Gregory D. Little's Unwilling Souls is a pulse-pounding chase through an epic fantasy world of adventure, sinister conspiracy, and a magical industrial revolution fueled by harvested human souls. Cess is the daughter of powerful parents who would very much like to kill one another and who therefore pretend she doesn't exist. An apprentice jailer of the gods, Cess spends her days learning to forge the tools needed to maintain the gods' prison. When her terrorist father attacks the prison on her 16th birthday, 
Cess is forced to flee after the secret of her parentage is revealed. Suddenly on the wrong side of the law, Cess realizes the very father who abandoned her may be the only one who can protect her. But some secrets are darker than parentage. On her way to find her father, Cess will uncover truths about her family and herself that will shatter her understanding of the world and risk the return of the gods themselves. Unwilling Souls and its sequel, Ungrateful God, are on sale now for only 99 cents. The third book of the series is coming early next year, so now is the perfect time to get up to speed. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2, only 99 cents for a limited time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have David Baldacci back on the show with us today to talk about his brand new Atley Pine thriller. It's number two in the Atley Pine series, and it's called A Minute to Midnight. Uh, David, I love this book so much. Uh, Thanks for joining me again. Oh, thank you. It's great. I'm really happy to be back. Uh, David, the, uh, the, I, I, when I got this book, I realized I had not read the first book. And so I went and grabbed the audio, uh, book copy of Long Road to Mercy. And I absolutely loved this new character of Atlee Pine. Um, where did she come from for you? Yeah, she was kind of an amalgam, I guess. I've, I, I had been thinking about doing a lead female character, you know, the sole lead in the series, which I'd never done before. A lot of my books are peopled with, you know, strong female characters, but they'd always either been partnered with someone or they were a sidekick. And and uh, I know a lot of women in federal law enforcement, you know, and some of the acronym agencies. I know how hard it is. It's still a very much a male-dominated world. So I wanted to sort of bring a female perspective to this, have her shoulder the lead role in this, and also partner her with not a guy, but a woman of a different generation, an older generation, as her assistant. And I thought that would be an interesting dynamic that you don't often see, and certainly in thrillers. Um, when we talked earlier this year about your your new fantasy series, um, we talked about your love of strong female characters and how um, you and your personal life have kind of been surrounded by strong female characters. Uh, what is it about these types of protagonists do you just love? Well, you know, it's it's uh, again. I I grew up around uh, females. My my um, I had you know twenty or thirty different aunts. My both my parents had huge families, um, and my mom was a very dominant personality. My sister was a, very independent. She's a journalist, um, and my, I'm married to one, and uh, we raised one. So uh, I am. I, I and but you know, a writer has to be very observant about it. And I think I have been over the course of my life and. Seeing how people react with each other, interact, um, men and women in some ways are the same, some ways very different. And even within that, you know, some females are very different from other females and males the same. So my job was to create an authentic feeling character in Antley Pine so that people, when they read about her and saw she looked at the world and perspectives she had as she dealt with other people, they would feel, okay, you know what, that makes sense. I feel like I've met someone like that before. You know, there's not, there's nothing, you know, sort of too fictional about it. She feels real. Um, and so it was kind of a tip of the hat to, you know, women who have uh, gone into these male-dominated careers and have really, you know, had great success and gone up the ranks, and which, you know, can be very difficult. Um, and I thought Atlee Pie was a good representation of that. Um, you have created some of the most memorable characters and protagonists in, you know, modern fiction. And uh, like you said, your books are, are are filled with with all sorts of characters. And you've had some really dynamic female characters um, in your books in in the past, in in all of them. Uh, but it's kind of a different thing when when your main viewpoint character is female and getting in that headspace and staying there. Um, how difficult a, a kind of a, a gear shift was that for you? And in the writing of the well, the, the two books now, um, you know, is it uh, is it difficult to get into that mindset and stay there? Yeah, no, it absolutely is. I mean, it's certainly not something natural for me and having not being that gender, but it was important for me to be consistent with it. So I, I worked a little bit harder on maintaining that voice and that pay and that, and that perspective page after page. And I kind of, you know, in this book, I had Carol Blum acting more like, you know, a mother, a pseudo mother 
for Atlee in some respects. Pine uh, grew up estranged from her mother. So some of the things a mother and daughter sh- would share typically in the course of a lifetime, and I know that with my my wife and my daughter, um, you know, she never had uh, that happen to her. She didn't have that experience. And so in this book, I sort of replicate a little of that between Carol and Atlee. It could be it's just as simple as picking out some clothes to wear uh, to go out for an evening with someone, you know, having a scarf or a wrap that, you know, would uh, accentuate what she was wearing or picking out a pair of earrings on a very sort of personal level, but also at the same time talking about relations with Atlee's own mother, talking to Carol about that, where, you know, it was difficult. And Atlee at times was very hostile towards her mother. She didn't feel like she'd been told the truth about a lot of things. And Carol was sort of the calm and reasonable one saying, you know, children should be able to you know, trust their parents. But if a parent is not truthful, maybe they had a good reason. She was trying to be a little more, uh, you know, even-handed about it than Pat Atley was, who was a little bit more, more emotional. But I really tried to be consistent on every page with that and not all of a sudden just forget that she was a woman and I just started writing like she was a guy. Um, so I had, to, I had to be, you know, I had to be more focused about that because that sort of is my natural inclination, obviously. With, uh, with as many books as you've written and such a tight publishing schedule that you keep, um, I would imagine that uh, after so many published books that, that there's a certain level of confidence in your craft uh, that comes with that. And do you have a, a first reader uh, that when you uh, finish a project or when you're working on it that you uh, allow someone to, uh, to read and to, to give you feedback on? Absolutely, I have a you know a small circle of people. Um, I almost always allow my wife usually to read the book and draft or read portions of it as I'm writing it. Um, she's very she reads a ton of books, reads more than anybody I know, and she can be very critical, which is what I need her to be. I need her to tell me not what's right with the book. I need her to tell me what's wrong, you know, with with parts of the book. And then I have my, my agent, my editor, um, they're in that feedback loop. They read to give me you know, their opinions and all that. And I take that seriously. I did a master class um, online this year, masterclass.com. You know, if you, they have directors and actors and chefs and all that. And I did one for writing. And I try to tell people the editing process, take it very seriously. And don't think that every word you write is written in stone and can't be changed. And other people have their opinions and they're professional and their goal is the same as yours to make the book as good as it possibly can be. You don't have to agree with everything they say, but you have to respectfully listen to what they're saying and then make your decision. Um, in in getting into A Minute to Midnight, uh, like I said, I, I went back and, and listened, to, listened to the audio book of uh, The Long Road to Mercy so that I could get a full picture of Atlee. I, I had not read that book yet. Um, but what I realized in reading A Minute to Midnight is that this this really could function as a standalone book. If someone just came into A Minute to Midnight, um, they they will really enjoy this story. Um, if they go back and read Long Road to Mercy, they will enjoy it even more and I think get a lot of the big picture puzzle pieces. Um, did, did Atlee come to you fully formed and did you, did you know that, because there, there's a, a bigger story going on in the background, did, did you have an idea and a feel for that story as she started forming? Yeah, you know, I, I I had an idea for her that she was going to be you know, physically formidable because I thought that was important for a lot of reasons she'd be that way. I wanted her to be vulnerable. She could be emotional, but she's tenacious as hell as well, and she needed to be that if she was going to be an FBI agent. But a lot of the other things, and I knew she had this huge emotional baggage, what happened to her sister and how that destroyed her whole family. So that was the emotional riptide that she had to deal with every day. And then aside from that, it really the stories grew, would grow organically. You know, I uh, eventually decided she's going to be in the Southwest, and that's where she's going to be living and working. She likes the wide open spaces. Um, she was going to have this assistant, Carol Blum. She was going to be sort of a maverick that would go not be afraid to go rogue at times to, you know, do the job she felt it should be done. And um, then, you know, in a minute to midnight, uh, I mean, when I when I finished Long Road to Mercy, all I knew that was eventually she was going to have to come to grips with, you know, what happened to her sister. And she's going to have to sort of attack that with a lot of energy. 
I just didn't know how. I didn't know really where this was most of the action was going to take place, who was going to be there with her, and what was going to happen. You know, and again, when I sat down to write A Minute to Midnight, those things were all on my mind, questions that needed to be answered. And as I was writing the novel, I figured them all out, you know, sort of one by one. And uh, then eventually got myself to the end and then didn't work from any detailed outline, just really trusted my instincts and the character that I created and what should be logically her next few steps, you know, and this long road to mercy. That's where the title came from. It was not going to be an easy route getting to the truth about what happened to her twin. It's going to be a long road. And in, in this book, uh, we see that in her her twin, she to, to bring folks up to speed, um, Atlee was one of a set of twins, and her sister was abducted and uh, presumed dead uh, for the last thirty years. And uh, in in uh, a minute to midnight, that starts coming to the fore, and and Atlee is uh, having to face up. This long harbored fear, uh, but maybe also getting some clues uh, to what actually happened. Um, do you? I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're absolutely right about that. And what when I was when I was first sort of conceiving how I wanted to start the new book, and it's very important. I like to start with a, a big pop. I want to draw the reader right in. And so I thought, okay, I'd left her in the last book. You know, meeting with Daniel James Tour at the Supermax Prison in Florence, Colorado. So I thought I'll open it with that scene again. It's a new meeting. She's gone out there again to see if she can get any more information. And and the reason she's there is because she thinks maybe this guy who was operating in Georgia back 30 years ago might have abducted her because, you know, he was a serial killer. He killed lots of people. She got no resolution at that meeting at the prison. He was a, he's a master manipulator. He just kind of stringing her along. She got frustrated. He said some things that really angered her. So, you know, it was not a good meeting. She left, and on the way back to Arizona, she's still in Colorado. She gets an Amber Alert. This little girl's been snatched by a bad guy from a soccer match. Fortunately, she sees the car, and so she gives chase, uh, chases him into a box canyon. He can't get out. She blocks the way. She gets out. They have this major confrontation. Uh, she's able to use her wits and some help from the little girl. And she rescues her, so she's fine. And she's got the gun on the guy. It's over. But something just grips her at that moment. It could have been just this anger of 30 years of not knowing this meeting she had with the serial killer, Daniel James Tour, that had infuriated her. She just blows, and she loses it. And she literally almost beats this guy to death. And the FBI comes down on her with a hammer because that's not what you do. And they gave her an ultimatum. And they said, look, you know, if um, you got to get your head straight, you got to figure this out. you got to figure out this past or you don't have a future with the Bureau. And so she flies across the country with her, Carol, her assistant, to immerse herself back in her past at this little town in Georgia where this, the most horrific thing in her life happened to her. And she has to solve this so that she can have a future going forward. Um, and that's really, that's the first two chapters of the book, and that's how it all sort of started. I felt like it was a great way to propel her, because if I ask her to do something extraordinary, you ask a character to do something extraordinary, you have to give really proper motivation, and I think the first few chapters, you know, accomplish that. Absolutely. Um, a lot of mysteries and mystery thrillers um, really play on uh, our emotions, but, but on on the way we perceive um, real things that are happening in the world. And I, I think right now, if you watch or read the news for any amount of time, you know, human trafficking, um, is something that, uh, that we're talking a lot about. And, uh, so there are a lot of parents and a lot of people that are worried uh, about their children and, and you know, being abducted. And it, it's just something that, that sadly we think about now more than, Maybe when you or I were kids and we just kind of free roamed, you know, neighborhoods and, and, you know, we just checked in whenever we checked in. Um, but the world's a very different place now. And this book, uh, this series of books really, um, uh, more so than a lot, uh, feels, feels raw in a lot of ways when you read it because this is something that, that I think about a lot and that a lot of people think about. Um, how do you go about when you, when you, when the shape of the story comes, starts coming about and you know the challenges that your characters are going to deal with, how do you start preparing for that? And are there certain resources that you read to kind of understand what, uh, maybe not understand the mind of, of the criminal, but to, to kind of, you know, understand how this stuff starts affecting them and, and victims. And how do you get in that headspace to, to properly tell that story? 
Yeah, it's you, you do. There is quite a bit of research involved, you know. And uh, as a parent of you know of children, I think about that too. My kids are grown now, but I remember my my daughter who's um, lived in various countries around the world and is quite the nomad. When she was going to move to Italy for a while, she manipulated it such that I could not watch the movie Taken. <laughs> I only was able to watch that movie after she lost. You know, their plane had left the ground. Um, so it's it and it is a stuff that you think about. So for me, and and in, in a case like this, and over the course of my career, I've tried to educate myself in lots of different fields, and most people really don't read a lot about because it's not something that you necessarily want to. I, you know, I've got uh, books on every forensic subject you could think about: police investigations, federal bureaucracies, you know, law enforcement agencies, state and federal. I've gone to morgues. I've gone on. Uh, I've trained at Fort Benning in Georgia with the military, writing about that. I've talked to police officers, FBI, Secret Service, DEA, CIA, every acronym agent you could think about. And I've read pretty much every book, you know, that's ever been written about serial killers, mass murderers, um, child hunters, and people like that, to get into the mentality of, of who they are and why they do what they do. And one of the things, you know, you read about this horrific stuff, and then people always say, oh, my God, how could he have done that? How could she have killed that little girl? And the answer is relatively simple if you know the literature and the, sort of the mindset behind it is that their brains are different from yours and mine. They are missing vital chromosomes, DNA connections, genetic material that you and I have that keep us from doing things like that. So when they say, how could they kill a little, per, a little girl or a little boy, they do not view them as having any worth or value or at all. Life to them does not mean anything. They are, they are narcissistic sociopaths, which means they can't empathize with anyone. So for them, other human beings have no worth. It's like they're stepping on a bug, and that's how they view it. And their, their lives are dominated by this obsession to control other people and to bring them pain and harm. And that's what gives them satisfaction. It's a horrible thing to have to experience and to read and to think about. But the sort of books that I write, if I'm going to do justice to them, I have to understand that because there's the only way that I can <clears throat> sort of build a story. I can't build the plot details that go into this. I can't tell you how serial killers go about what they do and what their motivation is unless I really steep myself in those scientific fields that have explained very carefully. This is why there are people like that. This is why, for instance, pedophiles can't be rehabilitated because we can't go in and change their brains. You know, we're not going to lobotomize people anymore because we don't do that. But stopping short of that, there's no way to add them, add in chromosomes, add in genetic material to them to make them normal. That's impossible. We don't have the technology to do that. So it is just, you know, that is a function of their brains that are very different. And I had to educate myself. And I think any writer, you know, that really cares about the material has to do the same thing. How how much um, pre-writing goes into a novel like this, and, and do you have to know the entire shape of the story to then understand the type of research that needs to be done? I, I What I call it is my battle plan. I drop a battle plan about, okay, what do I need to know in order to write this book? Who's going to sort of be in this book in a general sense? So with A Minute to Midnight, I had some things I needed to know about. One was, okay – I have uh, Daniel James Tour in the prison, so I needed to know about you know what that prison was like. I obviously needed to know about the FBI protocols. If she was going to be reprimanded for doing something bad, then I needed to know how that might be approached and who was going to deliver the message. You know what sort of superior in the FBI would do that. What uh, sort of uh, latitude would they have in saying, okay, you know what, you did this, but we're not going to fire you uh, because X, Y, and Z. But this is what you have to do if you want to continue to be employed by the Bureau. Okay, so I needed to know that. Then I knew she was going to travel to Andersonville, Georgia. So I needed to know a lot about Andersonville, Georgia. So I had to research that. I'd visited there a long time ago. And I had photos and stuff from my visit there, um, and I read more about it and to bring myself up to date. And uh, then some of the other things, there was technology that takes place in this book. I had some people who were really good at you know stuff online and uh, all those things. So I needed to understand internet, internet uh, privacy, piracy, how things are stolen, how things are monitored online. So I so those are my battle plan topics. And so I would research and read and. 
And the cool thing about that is that when you do research those uh, those issues, then all of a sudden you put one and two or three or four things together, and, you're, and all of a sudden you have a plot device. You know, you have a plot point. Okay, you know what? I found out about how people protect themselves online, then I can use that as a plot point in the book because I now have some new information and new knowledge. So those things kind of go hand in hand. Research often leads to plot momentum, plot devices and issues that I could use as well. And that is, okay, now when do I want to start the novel and what's the best way to open it? And, you know, in master class, I talk about the big pop. I, I don't want to spend five chapters, you know, describing a landscape. <laughs> you know, right. It's not going to happen. Uh, I want to hit the ground running with you. I want to give you some momentous action in the beginning. And we had the chapter one prison scene, chapter two, the confrontation with the pedophile and the little girl, uh, chapter three, the ultimatum. And then that's the jet fuel for the rest of the novel. And I figured if, if I could do all of that in three chapters and, you know, a dozen pages, then I got the reader locked in and ready to roll. Well, and, and if you do that much pre-preparation, then when you start writing and really get into that flow state, you're not stopping to look stuff up. You've got all that information that's just ready to be picked by your writer brain. Yeah, you you do. And, and let's say you're writing along and all of a sudden there is something that comes up that you needed a little more information about. You know, you have your sources, you have those sort of lined up already. And you can and I I continue to do this. I go back and I dig back into that material, I talk to somebody else, get some more information and then go back and plug it into where I need it to be and off I go. And at the end, there may be some holes here and there where I put pins into the story where I knew that I needed something there. But I'm not. I don't have it yet. I, but I have other things I want to keep writing, so I keep going. And at the end, I go back and I collect my pens and I go off and I think about it some more, do some more research, and come back and I fill all those pen gaps in. And uh, then at the end, you're you know, there's the novel. All right, um, David. I know that you are a lifelong Virginian, and um, the the character of Atlee that you created is is from Georgia. Um, but when we first meet her, she's working in the Southwest. And um, I really love how in these novels, place um, really becomes a character and really um, starts to define the story in, in a strange way. Uh, and and Atlee's surroundings inform uh, her as a character. Um, how important is place uh, to your writing and um, understanding how the different places we are in the world affect the the people that we are or the way we behave and react. Yeah, I think you know, from a novelist's perspective, they're critical. Um, in the first novel, a lot of the action took place around the Grand Canyon, which is a phenomenal thing. I mean, it's just it's mind-boggling. And until you're there and actually see it, you can't believe something like that actually exists. And what a mysterious, foreboding place to set a thriller. And I, so it was very atmospheric, and I played on that atmosphere in the first novel, Long Road to Mercy. You know, she was in and out of that canyon all the time, and it played a prominent role in the mystery that uh, carried, was carried forth in the novel. In uh, A Minute to Midnight, a lot of the action takes place in Andersonville, Georgia. It's a real place, a tiny town, 250 people, southern Georgia. Um, they don't even have their own police force. They have a county sheriff's office. And it's very Civil War-centric. Uh, it's most famous for its infamous... Uh, prison, Confederate prison, Andersonville prison, where 14,000 Union soldiers died from starvation and disease during the Civil War. And and I didn't select that place just randomly, because anybody who's read the book will understand that there are a lot of elements, atmospheric elements, that are real in that place that play a pivotal role in actually how the mystery and the story plays out. But if I could if I could make people believe that they're in Andersonville, Georgia, you know, right this moment, and they're looking over Pine's shoulder, and they're seeing what she sees and experiencing what she experiences, and then they can go back 30 years in the past in that very same place and try to imagine what it could be like, then I've really got you where I want you as a, as a reader. I've got you hooked into this atmosphere. You really believe you're there in the moment. And when, when I read books where the writer accomplishes that, it's just a far more pleasurable experience because it's a lot more fun to be right in the middle of everything going on, at least believing that you are, than having this big buffer zone and you're very distant from it all. Uh, it also, I think, connects you better to the character. You really feel you know, what they're going through. Um, after 40-some-odd uh, novels uh, that you have written and published, um, how do you, David, keep your creative well full? Um, 
I, you know, I, I'm not asking like where do you get new ideas and that stuff from, but but sometimes it, you can just get tired and you just feel like you don't have anything left to give. Uh, what do you do as a creative person uh, to make sure that you still have more to give people? Yeah, I think one of the chief attributes that a writer can have is to have to be your curiosity um, machine can never stop. You have to be curious about everything all the time. And, you know, a lot of people spend their lives looking within all the time. They, they're sort of self-centered and they don't look past themselves. As a writer, when I go out, when I travel somewhere, when I meet people, I'm always thinking about, this is fascinating. I wonder how I could use it in a novel. That person's personality, that physical quirk they have, that idiosyncrasy, the way they talk, some special information they have, and how did they acquire it? That's fascinating to me. I wonder how I could use that in a story. When I walk down the street and I see somebody looking out of a window, I don't just see somebody looking out of the window. I wonder who are they watching for and are they being watched by someone else? Somebody gets on a bus, who are they going to meet and where is the bus going to go? Um, so for me, it's taking ordinary things that people see every day and uh, lending them extraordinary types of potential because I'm incorporating them into a story that didn't exist until I sort of thought of it. And for me, it's always, it's about acquiring knowledge. I, I crave information and knowledge. I read, you know, I read multiple newspapers, magazines, articles every single day. I mean, my screen time, I'm, you know, they give you a little readout each time of your screen time each week, how much right. you've been on the, online. And I cringe sometimes. It's like, how in the world could I have been on there for that long? But it's, it's, not, it's not just, you know, looking at cat pictures. I mean, I'm on there reading stories all over the world about all sorts of things happening because I never know where one of those might sort of one I just want to know what's going on in the world I think every person should but two it's also like this endless font of knowledge and information that later could be used somehow in a story well a minute to midnight is an extremely satisfying read and at the end of this book um, you will feel like you've been on an adventure uh, but there there is more story yet to be told. Um, not that you leave us on a cliffhanger, but At Atlee still has work to do. Um, how how many stories do you foresee uh, for Atlee? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm, I'm really bad about you know. Uh, being able to tell the number of books that a character is going to be in, because I just do it on a one-by-one -one basis. I, you, as you said, obviously there's going to be at least one more with her because things have some things are unresolved in this novel. But I, I believe that she's such a cool character that even after she resolves her past, that you know she's an FBI agent in a really kind of special part of the world that a lot of people never get to see. That going forward with her in new books, just dealing with her investigating crimes, uh, I think would be really exciting and pleasurable for readers. So, I don't know. You know, I my only my only litmus test is: do I want to spend more time with a character on the page? Do I feel like they have more juice in the tank? And if the answers to those questions are yes, then I'll just keep rolling. I love it. I love it. Well, David, I know that you have uh, a number of active series that you're writing right now. Who are we going to hear from next? The next book you'll see from me is Amos Decker, my memory man. Yes. He'll be back in the spring. And uh, he's in a new location, new mystery, and uh, but he's Decker. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always love a new memory man uh, novel. Uh, David... Thank you so much for joining me again. We're going to send everyone to pick up uh, their copy of A Minute to Midnight. Where can people find you online to dig into all that you do? You can go to two websites. One is davidbaldacci.com, and that links to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all these things that people tell me. Um, I don't understand them, but they tell me <laughs> I have to have them. So I do. And uh, then we have a, a foundation, wishyouwillfoundation.org, uh, and that's where we um, help provide funding for literacy and reading organizations and initiatives across the country. So those two sites you can go to and learn a lot about and we'll link up all of that in the show notes. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, always a pleasure to talk. Same here. Thank you. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Jason ate Thanksgiving dinner alone at the Horseman restaurant. He had the place to himself. Everyone else had somewhere to be. He picked at his burger and fries, thinking of meals past. Thanksgiving had always been Eliza's favorite holiday as Halloween had always been his. Jason glanced at the menu propped at his elbow. 
the horseman with his hand held high, carrying a tray with burgers and a shake. The horseman he'd seen on Halloween was no cartoon. That horseman was a thing of crematorium ash, of grave clothes and withered grass, riding a horse of autumn leaves and snail shells and pieces of skull. Jason's hand rose to the tender stripe of skin on his neck. The hatchet cut. You okay, honey? Jennifer, the waitress, appeared at his elbow. She had dyed her hair since he'd first met her. A pink stripe ran through the gray now, as if she had stuck her head in a cotton candy machine. Yeah, I'm... I'm full. She raised an eyebrow. That bad, huh? Jason glanced at his plate, still piled with food. Just not hungry. You know, I saw the headless horseman once, said Jennifer, refreshing Jason's cup. She glanced about, deciding something. She set the pot down on a nearby table and slid into Jason's booth with some difficulty, sucking her belly in. I've seen him, she whispered. Just like you. When? Oh, ten years ago. Jason glanced around to see if the cooks or busboys were watching, to see if she was playing a prank. Where? he asked, trying to sound casual. East of here. Sam and I used to live out on Sawmill River Road. I worked at my daddy's Applebee's franchise, you know. It's still there. Daddy sold it, though. It was around Halloween time and I was coming off shift. It had been a night, believe me. Parties of like twenty. We sang to the little brats, Happy, happy birthday from all of us at Applebee's. The horseman? Right. She produced cigarettes. Do you mind? Jason shook his head. Thanks. Don't tell the smoke police. Jason slid the saucer from beneath his coffee mug to serve as an ashtray. It was about midnight, probably. I counted my tips. And those little bastards stiff you, by the by. So I wasn't in a good mood. I was waiting for Sam to pick me up. I was smoking in the parking lot, trying not to catch my hair on fire, and I heard this thunder coming down the Pacantico Hills from the direction of the hollow. Rumble, 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 but it was clear out, and the sound got closer and closer. We had a full moon that night, hanging over the top of the ridge, and I saw him come up the other side, this black shape on a horse, fast as the devil late for church. He was down the hill before I knew it, coming right at me, and he jumped Sawmill River. Kaboom! And when he reached the parking lot, I saw. She drew one finger across her neck. Nothing. No head. And it wasn't any real horse, either. Too damn fast. He was in a hurry. Didn't even see me. Whoosh! My apron blew up. The dumpster started rolling. Car alarms. Blew out my damn cigarette. He shot across the field. Beeline due east. Never saw anything like it, so... She patted Jason's hand. I know you're getting laughed at, but not by me. She stubbed her cigarette in the saucer. Some of us believe you. 